Welcome to Real Booked with Lindsay and B, where we reflect on the parallels between bestsellers and blockbusters for laughs and social disruption. I'm B Jordan of BlueCouchLibrary.com, and I read the book. And I'm Lindsay Howie of MyRelationshipWin.com, and I watched the movie. I am cheerful. I'm glad. Yeah. How are you? I mean, I feel like I want to take my lungs out and rinse them and put them back in, and I'm whiny about it. I'm sorry. It's really not that big of a deal. I just whine sometimes. No, it's a huge deal. Jace is sick, too, and <laughs> he's had the whole cough situation, and I just feel bad for everyone. I'm going to try really hard to just keep my germs over here. I'm washing my hands all the time. I live with germs. I know. All of the germs. It we're, doesn't seem to matter. We're all equally exposed. It's going to you're going to catch it or not. I mean, it's a seasonal thing. Mm. So I'm used to having a whole bunch of stuff happen to <coughs> mm-hmm. my sinuses when seasons change. Yeah, just par for the course. Yeah, I'm going to get all congested and it's gonna be a whole thing it's gonna be an awful thing that we all have to live through I'm sorry <laughs> well that's lovely <laughs> uh totally off topic but you know reality so there we are there we are <laughs> hi Lindsay hey B. How are you? I'm cheerful. <laughs> I thought we already did this. Oh, we didn't start with the high part. I know. That's all right. We're <laughs> professionals. We already did it. This is going to be fun for you in editing to decide how much of this. Oh, no, the whole thing. Awesome. Yeah. There's no decision. It's just everything. They get everything. Oh, crap. You're we're welcome. Going. <laughs> <laughs> this week, I watched The Call of the Wild, which was. A 2020 adaptation, guys. Yeah. It came out in February. Yeah. There have been lots of adaptations. Do you know, fun story, I went and saw Knives Out, and the Call of the Wild trailer um, was one of the movie previews, (laughs) and I looked at my husband with this look like, oh, (laughs) I'm going to make Lindsay watch that terrible (laughs) movie. I'm going to do it. Like, he, <laughs> maniacally, evilly gleeful about it. Like, he felt bad for you, and I just keep laughing. I enjoy that he came home and he told me that he felt bad for he me. Did, he was like, she's really excited <laughs> about it. <laughs> she's kind of being mean, and I don't understand. And I'm like, no, it's going to be great. <laughs> and I'm just over here like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on! So... <sighs> So, yes, I read uh, Call of the Wild, which is a Jack London novel from 1903. Yeah, so that's a nice wide wide gap. Actually, so there's been a lot of changeover with the movie industry, obviously. But the last time that um, this was uh, adapted to film, it was the same company, but before their merger with Fox. So it was a 20th, 20th century film's adaptation back in like 1930s and so now they did another version but Chris Sanders the director of this film this was his debut uh for live action films he actually that is unfortunate (laughs) he actually directed (laughs) Lilo and Stitch oh really and How to Train Your Dragon oh (laughs) so like his background is really Interesting. Like, Lilo and Stitch is amazing. How to Train Your Dragon is super well received. I don't really care either way. It's fine. But but I'm really curious to know how that background and um, how him being that kind of creator has changed the way that he's adapted this from the original content, which I have no exposure to. I've never read the book. So, um, is it still going? Yeah, yeah. it's still okay. going. <laughs> Good call. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have not seen any of the adaptations. I read the book, um, I don't know, when I was 12 or something, and I just read it over the last couple of days because it's a super short novel. 
Um, but I, I doubt very much from the trailer that this adaptation is very faithful. Um, so I will give you a super quick rundown of more like the themes and feelings and the, the plot synopsis even. So the entirety of the story is told, our, our point of view character is Buck the dog. Um, that never varies. It is 100% Buck's story. He is the main character throughout. Um, <clears throat> we see him like get kidnapped and get beaten and learn how to be a sled dog and then succeed at being a sled dog and then take over at being a sled dog and then get beaten a whole lot more and get rescued. It looked like the movie was going to be about or told from the perspective of John Thornton. It's still about the dog. Right. It's just in between seeing him along that journey, we're getting the narration um, as if it is from John Thornton's perspective. Like, How did he know that, like, what was going on in Buck's head? Did he give you, like, this is what Buck was feeling or thinking? or No, Buck gave us a lot of that. From, like, visual? Yeah, because, because it was, he was still the primary character. Mm -hmm. It was just, you saw him go through all of the things, and there was someone that provided a little bit more of the background information. So, right. like... When he was learning to be a sled dog specifically, right? Like, he had to go through the acclimation to those dogs as his pack. Mm -hmm. um, so you could kind of see how at the beginning he was super standoffish and, and wasn't really understanding at all what to do. But then as he went through the daily routine of, come on, <laughs> you have to pull this sled now. Right. He gradually started to want to, like, care for the dogs around him, and that was evident in what he was doing throughout the story. Oh. Yeah. There was so not they a lot totally... of caretaker action in the book. <laughs> exactly. So they totally, like, I don't know, I want to say whitewashed over the authoritarianism, but that's not the right... No, what they <laughs> did was they adapted this story to reflect more modern sensibilities when it comes to what is leadership what is good leadership buck was a great leader in the 1903 novel because he kicked ass all over the place and literally ripped the throat out of spitz that did <laughs> not happen in the movie really really oh no um that scene was like uh buck took all of the other dogs out and they were chasing a rabbit yeah and buck caught it and then let it go and then Spitz grabbed the rabbit and killed the <laughs> rabbit. And that started the whole, oh I'm going to take over the pack Oh my god. Thing. And when Buck dominated Spitz, Spitz basically just like, deuces, and peaced out into... Seriously? The, yep. Wow. Yep. Okay, yeah. So the whole thing with the rabbit was um, was uh, like, a, like a poem almost to... It was still in prose, but mm -hmm. it was like a love letter to the bloodlust of the beast. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, the call of the wild. That's it. He was going to murder this fluffy bunny and eat it. Bathe his muzzle in its blood. Oh, yeah. He was going for it. He was at the head of the pack, but Spitz had been around the block a couple of times and went around and, like, took a shortcut and cut the rabbit off and caught it before Buck could, and he was enraged and then they fought oh okay yeah they i mean they but they had been fought, but like they had been working up to like a big epic battle like oh for sure like that was like buck was slowly winning over the right. pack but he was doing it in ways that was like less authoritarian dominance and more like circumventing that he did that intentionally in the book as well he basically sowed chaos and yeah. was like the trickster <laughs> prevented uh, prevented discipline from happening, but it wasn't um, because he was anti-authoritarian. It was just to um, undercut Spitz's authority. And then when he had it, he was right there. Wow. Yeah. See, and I was all uh, weirded out about the... Anthropor uh, <laughs> anthropomorphizing yes of Buck in ways that were like happy <laughs> it's even weirder to listen to 
them doing this in a novel in ways that are uh, violent and yeah. harmful. Well, <laughs> again, it's like it was written in 1903. Uh, oh. The Jack London was, I think he was in his early 20s or something. He was a young man. Yeah. Uh, so he had actually spent a year with sled dogs in the Yukon looking for gold or whatever. And so he had this whole romanticized notion of like the, the wildness of certain settings, bringing out the wildness inside of humans or dogs. Yeah. But why does wildness equate to violence? That's a totally That's... human thing <laughs> that we are absolutely projecting onto these animals, regardless of medium. But that concept of there being just a thin veneer of civility over this base violence and like command over the elements and your fellow creatures is definitely like the backbone of this book. Yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> yep. I'm I'm really liking the adaptation at this point. It was a warm fuzzy, like it was not at all like why okay. are <laughs> So we have established that John Thornton is a major character in a way that he wasn't in the book. Not that he wasn't yeah. a major character, but that he's present throughout the entire thing instead of like a quarter of it. So I wanna know what happens to John Thornton. Because I don't think that they could possibly end his story the same way they did in the book. First, because it's racist as fuck. And second, because less warm fuzzy. Yeah, no, um, not as much racism in the 2020 adaptation. I would imagine. Yeah. (laughs) I was shocked and appalled. Like, holy shit, this did not register when I was 12. (laughs) <laughs> Yikes. Yikes is right. 1903. Even the dogs are racist in 1903, guys. Oh, well, no, the, the author. Yeah. <laughs> actually. <laughs> this young white man in his early 20s. In 1903. <clears throat> who believed in eugenics. Oh, yeah, that makes, that tracks. It does. It doesn't make sense, but no, it tracks. It, <clears throat> the logic follows. But John Thornton, yeah, so we see him once Buck finally gets to Skagway, right? So, like, he was kidnapped from his judge home in California Mm -hmm. and uh, is spirited away in the middle of the night to Mm -hmm. the Yukon. On the way, like, he is beaten, basically. So, in the book, there's the man with the red sweater is the one who introduces him to, and it's capitalized like it's a proper noun, the law of club and fang. Yes. Okay. okay. So it's not, um, we're not given a title, but we're obviously shown that the association is the club. Mm-hmm. And that's how, that's um, where Buck's conditioning comes mm-hmm. from. Um, but then once the boat lands and he can get, <laughs> get off, he's back to being himself, who is... Like, he's very independent as far as dogs go, and he's very curious. So So, this was shown as an instance that was terrible, but not something that he carried forward, really? No, it was more or less that he learned that if he listened, then he would not have the physical punishment. So it was a a layer of conditioning for him, but it was not... um, It... It definitely stuck with him because there's late later in the movie, um, a different person uses the same technique. Mm -hmm. And so it it definitely stays, but it doesn't do anything to dramatically alter his core character. Okay. At that point, he's not even under the care of the man that was training him with the club. He's with a different person. Yeah. That, that, that follows, um, but it was presented as, like, this was his first introduction into this harsh new world, and he will carry the lessons of basically you know, hurt or be hurt, like, respect is given to the one with the biggest stick, See, was the lesson he carried forward. That was not at <clears throat> all the, um, the actions are similar, but the lesson was yep. different. The framing of the, the framing of how this affected him is a lot different, and this is actually where we see John Thornton for the first time. Because when he gets off of the ship in Skagway, 
John Thornton is also in Skagway. And so they inadvertently bump into each other and um, John drops a harmonica, which Buck picks up and follows him and then returns it. So there's this whole like meet cute thing that yeah. happens <laughs> between this dog and this old guy. And at this point, Buck is going to the place where he's going to be sold to then become a sled dog. Yeah. So he's still in transit, like yeah. not even actually there yet. He's just kind of, um, he escaped his leash with the guy that was taking him where he needed to be and was then suddenly exploring the area and happened to meet this guy that... Foreshad- not even foreshadowing. Yeah, I mean, kind of. kind of it is because they they definitely have a thing with the right. whole returning of the harmonica, and I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but from there, it's kind of like um, John Thornton is. We know who the narrator is at that point, so it's it's like an introduction for us too. Okay. Because this person has been telling this dog story. That makes sense. So now we see that he. Who he is. He yeah, exists. how this he introduction this came universe. to be. Exactly. Okay, so from there he gets sold to... Crap, I forgot the names of his first people. Uh, the French... Yep. Yep. Um, who is a male carrier. Yep. And had a committed route that he was always running behind on. Um, and his assistant slash wife. I don't know. It's not made clear. <laughs> there are two dudes in the book. I All don't right. remember well, their names. One was hey, diversity. <laughs> yeah. That's, put a pen in that. Yeah. We're going to come back. That makes sense. We're going to come back to that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's the, the sled dog team that has spits. Yes. Okay, so well, the only salient, the big thing that I can see that is missing because everything is just sort of perspective tweaked so far. Yeah. In a really big way. Which yeah. Which is really interesting. Um, the only thing that's missing called Curly that was with him um, didn't take as much beating as he required to become, uh, to learn the rules. Um, who was more was just friendly and open and everything was cool. And then when, we, when they had um, got there... And we're going to be sold. Curly was like, hey guys, what's up? Wagging her tail all over the place. Like, oh, new dogs to be friends with. And they like ate her. They like ripped her apart. She was like, oh, hey, this is going to be friendly. It's going to be fun. And one of the other uh, like established sled dogs in the town took offense to her friendliness. And then a gang of them like ripped her apart. This is really effed up. Yeah, so this was another, like, lesson that Buck carried forward of, like, you know, like, whoever has the biggest stick, the the law of club and fang, like, dominate or be dominated. Yeah, no, t- like, totally different moral yep. purposes <laughs> are directing these stories. Yep. Like, they're just, they're very different. I can see that. No one was dismembered in the making <laughs> of the 2020 adaptation. That's, that's nice. Yeah, well, except for the bunny, but that was really not dismembering. It was just kind of... Right. It was more of a, Yeah. Yeah. And that was, like, an outrage thing, too. It was. Like, everyone was like, <gasps> OMG. I wasn't really going to the eat the bunny. Scene. Right. Right. <laughs> okay, so then he goes and gets sold. Wait a second, though, oh, because wait. it kind of feels to me like Buck is an amalgamation of the book Buck and the Curly. The Like, they blended those two dogs together, kind of. Uh-huh. Because once Buck actually gets to the place where he's going to be sold, he like he still has dog um, mannerisms, right? Because he was a family pet, so like he's very large. He's mm-hmm. a very very large dog, so he's bigger than all of these other ones. But he's still like looking around and very curious. And he walks up to this one dog, and he kind of does a whole shake my paw thing, and the dog almost scoffs at him. Like I don't know how else. To... <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so he just kind of like puts his foot down and then just kind of gets a little bit Raw. Yeah. Raw. Raw. <laughs> but then at that point the people are coming to purchase him. Right. So it's not like a big deal but he's like, until I have the context of the book and I'm like Holy shit. <laughs> he <laughs> Buck didn't get his throat ripped out. Died. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to see 
like where this goes. Okay, tell me more. <laughs> well, at that point, the um, they come and he's looking for, um, I guess he was originally looking for two dogs, but Buck is like awesome, so he just leaves with Buck. And then he goes back and introduces Buck to Spitz and the team and his wife, and there's a whole comedic relief scene and then they go about their business trying to get him to pull this sled which doesn't go very well at the beginning and slowly gets better over time and as it gets better like as he gets better at performing that role he also starts to influence the team Mm -hmm. and his pack more um and more substantially until it kind of culminates in the whole rabbit scene, which yep. we talked about earlier. Same, just, again, with very different, like, the same steps, very different World views. The, they're yeah. totally opposite ends of the spectrum. Right. So, like, like, Buck um, undermining Spitz's authority was because Buck is, like, the socialist dog? Yes, that's exactly how it felt. He just wanted to, he wanted to help everyone get along more. Like, he liked being part of the team, and so he was trying to help everyone feel that way, is how it came across to me personally. There was a scene specifically where um, the team had stopped for a drink of water, and Spitz was not letting anyone else drink and so buck just kind of walked around him and made his own hole in the ice and then he made another hole in the ice and so the rest of the sled dogs followed him except for the one that spitz kind of freaked out on and then it just cowered and went away and i'm like this is so that's yeah that's super super very much um an interesting perspective on on what qualities of leadership Mm -hmm. we value like and why? And it yeah. comes across really um, blatantly when you are looking at dogs and it is something as salient as needing a drink of water. Right. Like, that's a very much, I care for you, I need you to have this. Yeah. <laughs> We're all in this together. Yeah. That's a totally different message than if you step out of line, I'm going to rip your face off. Because that was definitely 100% the message. And yeah, wow. Okay. So, the thing happens, he takes over, spits, slinks off into the night? Basically, yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So, when he is um, acclimating to being part of the pack, he has an experience, Buck has an experience with um, a black wolf that is actually his spirit animal in a weird way. I didn't recognize that until my second time through the movie because I thought it was just a regular wolf because there are wolves later. But anyways, <laughs> so Buck's answering of the call of the wild is actually attuning himself to acknowledging that part of him. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that it was interesting that they brought in this spiritual component with this. So the, the book definitely does something similar um in parts of the in parts of the book he will be like staring off into the fire sort of lost in thought not really paying attention to what's on going on around him and he will have like um sort of a vision or a dream or an imagining of yeah. like a primordial setting with a prehistoric man like um like, there is some ancestral knowledge yep. or awareness or remembrance inside of him that he is attuning himself to, That's that he is learning how to recognize. Um, of course, in the book, that's definitely a kill or be killed kind of Right. Like, the, the purpose of that is much different, but even throughout the narration, it is very much confided in us as if it is a remembering I really like that phrasing because it's it's very much how we're made to think of it yeah as Jack Thornton is going through the the evolution of Buck if you will while he's going through all of the different changes that he has to go through to survive essentially it's a survival tale yeah um so, in the book, they make it to, gosh, I don't remember where they were going. They make the trip, like, twice, and then they've, they've run a lot, and, like, 
the mail carrier people have to get a new team because this team needs to rest and they have to go. Oh, so, okay. So, like, they sell them because they, they've um, got stuff to do. For once, this guy makes his run on time, which I thought was just, like, to a place in the Yukon and then back to Skagway. Maybe it was more than one, but it seemed like it was just a route, so, like, there and back. And then when they got back, he got a telegram basically letting him know that his route was being um, done away with and he had to sell the team. Okay. So, so they did the same thing. Different situation, mm-hmm. but same thing. The team had to be sold in the book when they were... Oh, was it? Am I skipping? Am I skipping one? I don't know. He had several sets of owners. I think okay. I might be skipping one. That's okay. Um, from there, we went... Um, he went to... Um, Hal or Hank or is someone Hal. That, yeah of hell okay who was literally uh like <laughs> city hot shot yep okay so I think, again I think we might have skipped one set of owners and like the the French pe- guys people were an amalgamation but it doesn't matter because it was the same yeah um so by the time he got to Hal and his whole team was purchased by Hal um and and yes. crew they were exhausted like they needed mm. they needed two weeks off or mm-hmm. more like a month off they needed to rest and eat um but they were bought by this guy who did not know what he was doing and was a total jerk face that we put a pin remember in diversity when it comes to yep. female representation uh-huh. that's the only human female character we see is um gosh i don't remember their names there's hal and charles and Mercedes. Mercedes is maybe Hal's sister, Charles' wife. It's a small family unit. Mercedes is legit awful. Like, she is whiny. She's the best she one of the three. She cries all the time. She is selfish and just rude. It's just like, the dogs are tired and can't pull the sled, and she won't stop riding on the sled. And I don't know. It's like a whole terrible... She's hysterical in all of the terrible, like, historical representations of that word. It's, you mean stereotypical? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I personally think that Hal and Charles are much more horrible people in the movie specifically. All three of them are legit. Oh awful yeah, in the no, book. I'm like <laughs> but these are bottom of the barrel people, anyways. Representative but... of like the people who can't, I don't know, can't hack it, can't make it in this. Oh, they're one percenters all the way. Like, oh, they God. are one percenters. <laughs> they try to take a fucking old. Uh, record player, you know, with the giant yeah. phone thingy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on their sled. Okay, so <laughs> in the book, they're just basically making fun of these people because they don't know what they're doing and they've carried too much stuff. And it's like, they're like, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, because they brought a woman with them and that's why they have so much shit in their in their sled and it's too heavy. And you need- oh, yeah, no, it's hell all the way, but yeah. that's... Mm, yep. Yeah. That's why I put a pin in that to come back to it, because I knew you'd make the rage face. <laughs> yeah, well, I really don't like tokenism, especially when it comes to womanhood, but well, that's not even because tokenism. I'm biased. It's just like... It super is. It's the stereotypical, I am biased against you, yeah. here are all the bad things, let's shove them into one character yeah. and then make fun of it. That yeah. is exactly what tokenism is. I thought tokenism generally had the context, like the is the misguided context of being a positive thing, but it's not. Oh well, yeah, but all of the things that are white are misguided in some way. <laughs> Allegedly, this is a good thing, right? I no, mean, that's you're doing it wrong. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So Mercedes wasn't awful. No, she was still awful. Okay, <laughs> but of like- these three people. <laughs> she was the least she's the awful. least awful. Got it. Also, she's not the first female character that the movie introduced us to. Right. At the beginning, the judges, someone, was running errands with Buck through Santa Clarita or wherever. Right. And then there were, you know, other family members. And then one of the, the pair of yeah. the male carriers was also female. So... So, a little bit more. They also, yeah, and yeah. also, um, not all of these people had been white. So, there was definitely 
representation, whether or not oh. that is... That was in equitable. The, that was in the book, but not in a good way. Not. In a way that I haven't mentioned yet. Yeah, because the book was racist AF, and yeah. they totally like erased that in the movie and gave like people of color roles. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> We're doing it. <sighs> anyway, um, so the awful people beat the dogs. And like, the awful didn't pack people, enough food for them. The awful people were leaving like as spring is coming, so everything is starting to yep. fucking thaw. The conditions are awful. The dogs are already worn out. Yep. They don't know what they're doing. John Thornton actually confronts them when they are going to leave because um, Charles was given the club by Hal and told to make them go, and mm. so he was just gonna beat the fuck out of Buck, I guess. I don't know. Just hit him until he does what you want him to do. Because that's how no. things work. It's no. Not. It's not. No, it's not. And John Thornton knew that, so he intervened and then showed Hal how to um, release the rails on the yeah. sled or whatever. And all of the town is standing there laughing and it's really got to be uncomfortable for all these city people. So we had a similar scene, no John Thornton. Mm -hmm. um, the John Thornton scene when that comes mm -hmm. at the end. So what happens to the city people in the movie? They um, go off. Um, John tries to let them know that the <laughs> river is most likely going to break up right. and you're probably going to die. Like, hey, you're going to die to death of stupidity, so you should stop. But they thought that he just wanted to keep all the gold to himself, so I'm not going to listen to you, right. old prospector, because the fortune is mine. Okay. Cackle. <laughs> <sighs> Got it. So they left, and, like, the dogs are struggling, and everyone is miserable and complaining, and they start whipping the dogs, and basically, they get to the river... And then everyone collapses with exhaustion, and then in walks John Thornton right before Buck gets shot in the head. <laughs> so he saved him again. They were going to shoot him? Yeah, they were going to shoot him. Okay. So in the book, they had been, like, starving. Um, they had started with a team of 14, so they had added twice as many dogs to Buck's original team because their sled was so heavy. Mm. Um, and then by the time they got to, I don't know, wherever John Thornton was, which was when we finally meet him, they were down to like five or six dogs because they kept, they wow. were, oh yeah, they died because yeah. they were starving and worked to death and also beaten to death by these terrible humans. So we get... They're way more terrible in the book. They're way more terrible in the book. They're like literally beating these dogs to death and... Buck is still, like, the leader, but they've got, like, they're exhausted, their skin and bones. It's horrible. Every time the sled stops, they all drop. Yeah. Because they're exhausted. So yeah. So we get to, I don't know, whatever outpost that they were. John Thornton had, apparent, according to the book, froze his feet. So apparently he got frostbite and had been left by his two partners, um, who he was prospecting with here at this comfy outpost. And he was just kind of chilling, waiting for spring they were his partners when to come back they were going to do something else and uh so these terrible people show up with their dogs and are going to continue on across more ice now and he's like you shouldn't do that you're not going to make it and they were like well they said that we wouldn't make it this far and we did all like cocky and boastful and proud but the the dogs like wouldn't get up because they were exhausted and had impending feeling of doom because they were running over the ice and recognizing that like this isn't safe. And so Buck had just decided to like, well, no, I'm going to die either way. So I'm just going to lay here. And the guy was going to beat Buck to death with his club. And that's when John Thornton was like, nope, you're done. And so we see like he cuts Buck out of the traces. Buck is just laying there like, maybe I'm not going to die. I don't care yet. And the bad people like convinced their four or five remaining dogs to get up and go and then like they're they're not even out of eyesight yet and the the ice gives way and they all drown wow yeah <laughs> 
So the moral huh. of the story is if you're a bad person and Jack London doesn't like you, you're going to die. I mean, it sounds like Jack London <laughs> might have been kind of a bad person and He's, wanted black people actually, to die regardless. Like, he was a really complicated figure. Like he was a Most super people are very fucking, complicated. Yeah, super fucking giant racist who believed in eugenics and also a giant socialist who was a promoter of unionization and like workers' rights. Yeah, but only the right workers. Yeah, rights. basically. <laughs> All right. We're not going to touch that right now. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to circle back to, yes, the team was completely exhausted and Hal had had it, like, up to here. And so he was getting ready to, like, he pulled out his pistol and he's like, fine, if you're not gonna, and then here is Jack, uh, not Jack London, he's the author, <laughs> John Thornton. Here is John Thornton again, like... You better not do that, mister. Right. This is, this is not gonna, this is not gonna end well for you. The man taking a stand. Yeah. So, he cut the dog out of the, like, Buck is passed out, like, done. Yeah. Just can't anymore. But we see them leave, and they don't fall through the ice. They don't die. They don't die They have an ambiguous ending. There's, no, it's not, it gets wrapped up. Oh, okay. (laughs) At that point is not it. Okay. <laughs> Curiouser and curiouser. <laughs> yeah. But then, like, John's got to get Buck back to his cabin, which John Thornton came up to the Yukon because his son died. And, like, there was a thing at home, didn't needed to go somewhere else. So he's not really there prospecting. He just is there because it's the end of the world. And it turns out that he and his son had... had talked about going on this kind of a trip before. So he was nostalgic, went somewhere to be alone, met Buck. Okay. When he rescued Buck from Hal and crew, Buck was done, like, Mm -hmm. at the end of all of his resources. So Mm -hmm. basically goes and sleeps in John Thornton's bed for two or three days or whatever. Like, it's just passed the fuck out and not at all good. (laughs) Yeah. When he comes to, though, um, John Thornton is at a bar in Skagway and um, gets confronted by Hal, and then Buck intervenes. So it's like this whole reciprocated of the saving. Okay. Yeah. Um, And we find out then that the rest of Buck's team had left Hal and crew, like, in the middle of the night, I guess. They just... Just, like, out. Just, no more of this. No Let's... more. Yep. Rebellion. S- and I don't have any idea what happened to Mercedes or Charles, because it's just Hal at this point, and he does not make it clear, like, what happened to his people at all. They bounced with the dogs. Maybe. <laughs> and left everything, record player included, just out in the wilderness somewhere. Wherever they made it, which is also not clear. Mm -hmm. But now, Hal has it out for John Thornton. Okay. Like, going to get him because this man is the one that made these bad things happen to me. Right. Even though everyone that I've encountered since I've gotten here has told me that this is bad news and I shouldn't be doing (coughs) this, it's definitely John Thornton that has foiled my plans to become rich. Okay. I think it's really interesting to note also that um, the shift in priorities in what is deemed acceptable in a hero type person is John Thornton was definitely a prospector who was out to make it rich Mm -hmm. in the book. Like, he didn't have a tragic backstory other than he froze his feet, (laughs) but apparently he's better now. So he and Buck were both sort of recovering and limping around and like bonding or whatever. He had two other dogs. <clears throat> yeah, no, I mean, it's a totally totally different perspective. Totally different person. Absolutely separate characters. Yeah, for sure. It just, it's, again, the the difference in priorities. In, but it tracks, though. Yeah, I mean, it really... It absolutely does. I, <laughs> I don't think it's a negative thing. I, I just think it's really interesting to point out that Um, that John Thornton was specific, like, that these bad people, Charles, Mercedes, and Hal, were definitely, like, already really wealthy and were looking to 
to seek out more wealth, Mm -hmm. where John Thornton was just there for adventure or solitude or personal reasons. Whatever, exactly. He was not there um, in advancement of his own wealth, which I thought was and just a really interesting thing that was very very different because it was like it was the gold rush right so that's what everybody was there for that is what everyone was there for and that's not seen as a bad thing in the book it's definitely presented as like an adventurous um like uh honorable sort of way to increase one's wealth and social standing Honorable. It, I mean, I don't know that that word specifically is included, but it's definitely presented as a positive thing for someone to go and do. Yeah, no, I I understand why they frame it that way. Mm-hmm. Like, I get that mentality. I think that the whole concept of manifest destiny yes. is predicated on feeling that way yeah. about doing that. <laughs> Definitely. I just wanted to bring it up because it yeah. was one of those really notable differences. And that it's stuck one of out those to me. It's one of those things though that like they almost Disneyfied in the movie. Yeah. Right? Like because yeah. it's there. They're obviously there to like, prospect. It's the gold rush. And Skagway <laughs> is full of these people. Yeah. Like it's not just Hal and crew that are there no. to do this. It's everyone is there the reason, for this reason. Yeah. That's why these places exist. That's why right. the mail route exists from this place to that place because that's where all of this development came from. Yeah. Like, all of that's there. Yeah. But none of it is the prevalent components of yeah. what we're learning or what we're being entertained by. Right. I just think that's really interesting. Um, also, there was a scene with John Thornton in a bar. It was after uh, they had been together for a long time like six months or more buck had fully recovered and was in peak physical condition and was not only a, a pet and like he bonded with john thornton in a way that it's made clear he never bonded with anybody else he loved john thornton with a uh, slavish adoration which is the same thing as love it's not i said that to make her make the rage face again <laughs> anyway he um <laughs> big feelings for John Thornton and uh, and would do anything for him and like he was a working dog he enjoyed that and so he did that for John in whatever way he needed to carry a pack or pull a thing out or whatever and so John was at a bar at some point drinking and boasting about how awesome his dog was because you know how men are with their strong horse or dog or fast car or big truck or whatever boys and toys oh my god (laughs) and so he was like boastful about it and somebody called his bluff and so like this big um it's framed as like a big heroic moment where there was a bet made and it was an absurd amount of weight on a sled and he broke it out himself with commands from John and pulled this thing however the distance and it was like amazing because he was so big and strong my dog's bigger than your dog Uh, my dog's bigger than yours (laughs) and it was like like this big climactic moment he also like saves John from drowning one time like it was a there was more like actual heroism but this was a big climactic (sighs) moment even like the form the way that they express love was very like um backwards stunted masculine (laughs) wait like John, John would like grab the dog's head and shake it and like whisper like curse words at him like you know like I mean, I'd call out sometimes, like, you're such a bad dog. But, but now, like, cuss at him. And in return, Buck would, like, bite his hand. Mm. Male bonding. Like, I don't know. Even even the forms of affection that you allow your main characters to show one another are violent. And that's, you know, meant to show us what inherently, like, rough and rugged creatures these men and dogs are and like that's a it's a positive quality that led to their survival in this setting I really appreciate that things have shifted so very far between 1903 and 2020 I mean it's like I look around and I go oh, wow we've got a lot of shifting left to do oh yeah um but there there are at least these 
perspective shifts that are taking place taking place that are actively happening i really wish that they took place in a way that still acknowledged like what happened before and like explained the under underpinning of the purpose or intention of the change i mean that's what i wanted to do this for Uh, yeah because it's (laughs) interesting it's it's really interesting the, the changes that our society has dictated to the same story um they're just completely different and this isn't like the only adaptation of this story i mean this has been adapted several times over the hundred years right (laughs) 120 years (laughs) right so it's it's been a long time and this story has gotten the opportunity to be retold enough that you can actually track the changes in things like how we value uh, connection and what we deem to be good leadership by looking at those shifts in all of the different versions. So it's really interesting to have the juxtaposition of the original content with the most recent content because holy shit, they're totally different. Yeah. They're like from different planets. They like (laughs) only nominally even the same story because they're even hitting the same plot points, but in such a different different, way. Yes. From such a different perspective. So, okay, um, what happens then to John Thornton? Because it's the yeah. call of the wild. I assume it's the Buck call is of the still wild. hearing the call of the wild. So he is, um, but there is definitely the bonding with John Thornton. There's the appreciation of, um, you know, he was in this really horrible situation and John rescued him. And so he reciprocates that and stands up for John when that need arises. And then they kind of, like, end up bonding over like John's backstory and like he's telling Buck about the trip that he had wanted to take with his son and (coughs) then he gets out this map and basically they want to go off of the map and so he's like there's no reason for us not to go we're just gonna do it and so we then see Buck and John go out into the wilderness um you know, canoeing down a river and like just doing all of the different things and outdoorsy montage. Outdoors, yeah, totally. And it gets to the point where like John doesn't have a map anymore, so he just follows the dog. And now Buck is like leading the way for them to continue journeying into the wilderness until they happen upon a cabin by a river and that's where they hang out. So John starts to kind of pan, and Buck starts to slowly venture out into the surrounding area and meets the wolf pack. Okay. So let me pause there to catch up with what happened in the book, because again, it's the same thing, but different. Yep. Um, John Thornton has two partners. I have forgotten their names. They're not essential characters. He has two partners and also two dogs, and so there's a whole group of them. Um, between the humans and the dogs and they're yep. they're prospecting they're looking for gold they're doing their thing they have had some success and then they decide that they want to go find some mine of legend and that's why they're venturing like so far off the beaten path and so they find an old abandoned cabin that they think might be somehow connected they start panning for gold in the river right there and they're just like pulling out buckets of gold. Yes. Holy gold. There bags a... stacked next to the cabin door like firewood of gold. <laughs> oh, we're all going to be rich because that is actually important to John Thornton of the novel. Um, and that is when Buck starts venturing out farther and farther and becoming more of a, a wild creature and hunting. There's a whole like hunting montage in the book. He kills a moose like a big giant like leader of his herd moose he like cuts it off from its herd and stalks it for days until it's weak and exhausted and kill yeah he's a killer he's a killer he encounters um he encounters a wolf alone it's it's by itself and like after awkward standoff like they run together and the wolf is like okay cool you're one of mine now come with me Um, But at that point, he's been gone from camp for, like, days. And it was like, oh, John Thornton, I'm not not answering the call. And so he goes back home. And so that is a a pattern where he goes out and is gone for days or a week. 
living in the woods hunting and being a wild thing and then comes back because he can't like John Thornton is his tie to civilization is the one thing that is keeping him from like fully embracing yeah wildness like that tether is there but it's not um it's gradual in the other way so like when they first get to the cabin like they clean it out and they recognize prospecting equipment and so since there's the river right there like they're just messing around with it and there's like a comedic relief section where like John is panning and like he found something and he got excited about it and so once he found something he was like hell yeah (laughs) right and he's totally into it now it's fun it's fun and so Buck is like yeah Buck is like in the water and he pulls up a rock and John's like no more like this and so like John goes back to his pan and Buck pulls up like this giant honking nugget (laughs) And he looks so excited about it, but John's, like, still pants, so he just drops it, right? Uh. <laughs> and then picks up a smaller one, and John's like, yes! <laughs> like, oh, That's you could have bought a whole yeah. state. Doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, oh, comic relief. I wanted to talk about, like, the one comic relief moment in the whole book when they were still, he was still with the French guys, and he was still, like, learning how to be a sled dog. Yeah. His feet were like getting cut up and beat up from the trail and so the one of the the guys made him little like moccasins okay like little dog moccasins out of the leather from his own boots and one time buck uh he forgot to put them on buck and so he wouldn't leave camp he was rolling around with his feet in the air like demanding his little his little boots, boots. so that was again that was the one comic relief instance in the book and I wondered if it made it into the movie if the dog got little boots he did not get little boots damn it the way that you started telling that I thought it was going to be sad lol no it was genuine (laughs) funny like he was rolling around like I need my little boots and the guys all laughed and he got his little boots and then eventually he like wore them out and his feet were toughened and he didn't need them anymore but no it was like it was not a sad lol it was like an actual like that's funny no but it was the one time in the whole book that the author went out of his way to go look it's funny like he didn't there was no funny no I th- like they went the opposite way with this edit. Like everything that Buck does is like over the top and derpy, and, but not like in a bad way. Just like <laughs> I don't know. It's really interesting because he's not a person, so like all of his facial expressions are not how the dog yeah. would be like. Um, like I said, it was kind of opposite in that when they first got out to quote unquote the wild, right? Like they were spent still spending time together until off in the distance, Buck saw a white wolf and he got curious. And so John's like, go ahead, have fun. Be back before dark. (laughs) And so that's kind of the pattern. Like he'll go and explore during the day, but still come back, um, in the evening And slowly he starts to be gone for longer, Mm -hmm. and then he starts to, like, bring back things, like a pheasant or a fish or whatever. And so he's, like, still providing for John. Like, they still have a lot going on, but he's also acclimating himself to this wolf and her pack until he sees an opportunity where he can step in and he saves one of their pack mates from going over a waterfall And then he suddenly is viewed and accepted differently by these wolves. So instead of being like an outsider, they start to allow him more, uh, more room to really become kind of part of the pack. And he does like, he takes that opportunity, but it's still like a a much more gradual. It took a while for him to be out all night. Mm -hmm. And then there's a confrontation between him and John when he comes back because John's drinking and he pours out his bottle of alcohol. Like, there's a whole... (laughs) 
there. There's the whole thing. The dog is like <laughs> a drinking. nanny dog who pours out his whiskey so that he can't drink because the dog knows that it's bad for him. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. But he gets back this time and Don's like, nope, not again. And so he's like, you've been staying out longer and longer. <laughs> yeah. But it's like him coming to his own realization that he's done with this space. And okay. so it ends up turning into this, um, the scene eventually becomes John deciding to leave, right? And uh-huh. let it, him letting Buck know that he can come with him, he can stay, he needs to do what he needs to do. Um, and then shortly after that is where Hal re-enters the storyline and ends up confronting John Thornton, shooting him, the cabin gets caught on fire... Um, Buck rushes back into the scene, sees that John is mortally wounded, attacks Hal, he gets pushed into the burning cabin, and, like, as John Thornton is dying, he's, like, pleading with Buck to go and just be your wild self, and that's what he does. Okay. (laughs) He goes back to the White Wolf, and he becomes the leader of the pack, and he has little hybrid puppies, and can chase off bears, and becomes the king of the forest. Huh. I am surprised that they killed off John Thornton. I was thinking that they were going to find a way to 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 give him a happily ever after because he definitely died in the book. That's... So I believe that the way that they gave him a happily ever after was he was able to complete a letter to his wife, and um, Buck actually took the letter from him. Like when he was doing the mail run, that was a whole scene too. He was okay. late for the delivery of the letter, and the wow. mail carriers were like, "Oh, you missed it," and Buck took it anyway. So that was another, like... So he had, like, he had closure. He had closure and that he had, like, he signed his divorce papers, his wife got everything, and she got a letter. And he had, like, got whatever he came to get and was ready to move on. Yeah. And so it was, like... It was, like, he was done. He was ready to leave. And he was leaving sans all of the gold. So whatever internal processing he went through, like, he went from finding the gold... Getting super excited, wanting to be a railroad tycoon to, like, abandoning everything in the same stream that he found it and Mm -hmm. wanting to go home, essentially, back to his wife. Okay. Interesting. So, it was like a whole, whole character arc just in the last half of the movie for him. Mm -hmm. But it was really interesting to see how his role supported Buck in being able to do what Buck needed to do to answer the call of the wild. But that it wasn't like just a, a complete shift to this rogue character that doesn't care. Like there was very much a, a bond there that they both kind of reciprocated. And that was really interesting and very, very heartfelt. It was, there was lots of awe moments. Aww. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not quite as many all moments in the book. <laughs> like ah, <laughs> visceral, different. Go to that. <laughs> it's different. Yeah, <laughs> it's very different. That's funny. Um, no, John Thornton and everybody, the dogs, his partners, everybody was murdered. Murdered? Murdered. By Buck? No, oh, no, okay. there was a tribe of, uh, yeah, this is where the holy oh, no. fuck racism comes <gasps> oh, in. Oh, okay. Yepers, yep, that's there. <clears throat> so, I don't, I didn't actually, I don't know if the tribe that is a, is a, um, made up, or if it's a real tribe, if they are <clears throat> an actual tribe, they, I... Oh, they deserve all of the proceeds for the Call of the Wild for and the all last the hundred and seventeen oh, years. Proceeds, oh Plus. my god! So this movie cost like millions of dollars to produce, and it totally bombed at the box office. Oh yeah, I and saw it's that. gonna like because it, of this 
derpy CGI dog. That's I thought that you were going to laugh through the whole thing and you liked it. And I'm surprised. And like, I'm not disappointed. But again, I was gleefully excited about like, tell me how bad this movie is. And you're like, no, it was good. It made me go, aw. <laughs> I mean, once you know, like it's a CGI dog. Yeah. Obviously, it's not a real dog. Right. So once you like are okay with that, it's really like, it's not as bad as the like Scooby Doo CGI, <laughs> right? Like it's not that it's not anymore. Meant to be cartoonish, no. It just is a little the bit. The only part that's overly cartoonish is like his size, his facial expressions, yeah. and some of his behaviors. Yeah, like, but that's because <laughs> that's right. because they didn't make it like vicious and hostile, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, that. <laughs> So yeah, John Thornton and, and crew are are killed, um, and then Buck has been gone for I don't know a week because he just goes right, and then he comes back and then he goes again. So he comes back and he's like, "Oh no, something's wrong," and everybody has been killed, um, and so he like rips the throat out of several humans, and that's yes because. <laughs> the bright ones? Yeah. <laughs> well, his people had already died, so uh-huh. the not his people. The right ones? I don't know. Uh-huh. It's a f- fiction, per- perhaps fictional tribe that had attacked because bad stereotypes. All right. And well, racism. So. I'm just going to go ahead and reiterate that Jack London was a really fucked up human. Yeah. Lots of white people are. Yeah. I still love you. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah. And then his last tether to civilization um, has been cut, and he goes and finds his wolf brother and is the primordial beast. That is so different, because, like, even as, like, the movie is closing out and you see that Buck has become Alpha... Like, one of the last lines is, and still every season when he comes down from the wherever, he stops to remember the man at the... He does still go to the cabin and, like, have his feelings in between, like... Answering the call. Right, whatever, like, thing that he does out in the wild now. I don't know. I just, it's totally and utterly opposite in my head. These are two... I mean, thematically, yeah. these are two opposite, completely opposed pieces of fiction. Yeah. Which is, it's so, it's so weird. I was wondering how they were going to merge the, like, gritty, visceral, blood and guts realism that Jack London was striving for with this derpy cartoon dog. And they just didn't. They just did a completely different thing, which is, I think, um, the best adaptations do their own thing. Like, everybody who reads a book wants to see the book, like, exactly how they envisioned it in their heads. And that's never going to happen. But it's a completely different medium. In a lot of cases like this, it's a completely different time. It shouldn't be the book as you read it on screen. It should grow and change and fit both the new medium, which is visual, instead of text-based, and also the society that is creating this right and now. And absorbing it right now. Yes. Because that's the other component and why I almost really appreciate that they did choose this director. Because yeah. it is such a very uh, specific background that he has and it's a very unique perspective when you're considering something that is so oh I don't even know what to call it because I haven't actually read it so but it just sounds (laughs) I mean it's like got super fucked up mentalities like the the belief system of the author is throughout the whole thing is the theme and backbone of all of his writing and also I enjoyed reading it like I don't recommend it to anyone because holy racism guys like not even a little bit the whole thing the word half breed is used oh wow to describe a human not a dog okay 
It's not okay. Uh, I, I, no, no, not that you meant that. No, <laughs> it's just, you're right. B, it's not okay. It's super not okay. He did that though. He did that. That exists so. in this book. Um, and it's it's a beloved classic. <laughs> yep, that's <laughs> about that all we need to know about American culture, right yeah. there in a nutshell. Kind of, yeah, actually, uh, that's. That's it's not gone now. It just looks different now. No, because the same the same people who deemed it uh, important when it was written. I mean, maybe not like literally the same humans, but the same individuals. But the same kind of person is still saying, "Oh, it's so powerful. It's so you know, um, it's a literary masterpiece, and it's beautifully written." And I love that he does not shy away from writing um, from the perspective of an animal. I love that he um, he does not shy away from alliteration. I love that he, I, I like, if he was a decent human being, he could have wrote some really incredible things. As it is, there's a reason that these books stand. Um, and a lot of that is because the people who choose books are white, racist men. And they always have been. Yeah. And, like, he had this space to create this work, whereas many people who have arguably better mentalities and or worldviews are purposefully kept from spaces where they can do things like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I, I, I understand that society will always evolve and that's accumulation of kind of everything around us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's never not going to shift. That is part of what life is. It's that kind of growth. And since we are all a part of that, we're all connected to that. We're all affected by that. So mm -hmm. looking at what was this story and how that has shifted to be this new version of it, mm -hmm. it can be very informative and it can also give a lot of space to have a conversation about why this character is doing the thing that they do. Mm -hmm. My problem is that I don't want people to read the 1903 version of this book. And go, oh, this says important things. Like, no, this is an this angry 20-something-year-old man. not important anymore. No, this is... It's important <clears throat> as a uh, vivisection of history that I can look back and be like, oh, this was acceptable for whatever this publishing company is to provide to the general public mm -hmm. in 1903. That means that as a society, we were really suffering from a lot of different mental things that have now shifted to be other mental things. Right, like we this still have how... a lot of issues, but these specific things, this, this super authoritarianism, this undercurrent of brute strength and violence, like these, this this hyper-masculine view of goodness and rightness, these things have started to shift. And that is exemplified by the difference between the 1903 book, The Call of the Wild, and the 2020 movie, The Call of the Wild. Like, I like that we can see the changes that we've made. It kind of even makes it easier for us to project the changes that we need to continue to work on. Yes, because we can pinpoint what has changed, and that's why I really like the space to talk about those underpinnings and why it's changed, mm -hmm. because then the, those whys can be applied to what's happening right now yeah. and how we can keep pivoting in the right direction. Yeah. It's... You have to be able to connect those dots to see a bigger picture. Most people just absorb the content and don't offer that space to connect the dots. And that's why I think it's so important that we have these conversations. Mm -hmm. It's different, but Jack London and Chris Sanders are the same profile of person. Right. <laughs> okay, so it's not that different when you consider the fact that these two men have very similar backgrounds or mm -hmm. profiles or, or whatever you want to call them. So the fact that this was written a hundred and whatever years apart and, and this person, the, the profile of the creator has shifted so much that these two very polarized things can be created from the same type of person mm -hmm. means that there's been a lot of shifting and being able to acknowledge those points is 
really, really imperative for everyone. Well, that did not go how I expected it to. I like all of our conversations that, for that reason. <laughs> that was really cool. Yeah. That was a really cool juxtaposition between these two like but entirely unlike things. That's pretty cool. I, I'm glad that we did this book and movie. I agree. I am also excited about doing Emma. <laughs> and we also have the Hunger Games trilogy that oh, is on yes. our docket. Yes. It's coming. So in preparation for that prequel, we are going to break down each of the three books slash movies and do their own individual episodes. That's going to be fun. I think that's one that has held up really well. I don't know. It's been a long time since I've read it, though. So I don't know. I am starting to really appreciate that we are looking at all of the different types of content that we are, mm -hmm. because I think that the conversations that we have are much different based on the time that's passed between the original format and the adaptation format. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about doing it the other way, um, watching a movie that was later turned into a book? Movie novelizations? Yes. I looked at one. I don't remember what it was now. It was really interesting in the moment. I have had one experience with a novelization of a movie. I watched, um, oh gosh, I only remember the subtitle, which was, um, it was something about a mountain and return of yellow dog. It was one of those, you know, it was like a golden retriever got lost in the mountain and had to make his way home to his boy mm -hmm. movies. Like another one of the boy and the dog movies yeah. slash books. And I remember that the novelization, even at the age of 10 or whatever I was, was horrifyingly bad. <laughs> so I am willing to give it a shot. Perfect. I want to ask you guys then out there if you have any novelizations that you would like to hear us discuss because I think that that would be a different type of perspective shift yeah that would be interesting to talk through but I again don't have very much exposure to uh, novels that have been created because of a movie so if there's anything specific that you enjoyed or you think you would enjoy us talking about Please don't hesitate to either drop a comment below or get into our Facebook group. We can have a whole discussion about novelizations and whether or not those have been positive experiences for you. Awesome. Good talk. See you guys later. Bye. Thanks for listening. You can join the conversation in our Facebook group. The page facebook.com forward slash real booked will direct you there. If you want to support us and get more content, find us on Patreon. And you can always email us directly at realbooked at gmail.com. All music in this episode provided by purple-planet.com. Hope, Hope we, we hear, hear from, from you, you soon. soon. <laughs>